Welcome back to Covered in Pet Hair. I'm your host, Isabel alvarez Arada, and today I have the pleasure of having a drink and a chat with a pet parent, an entrepreneur, a canine behavior consultant, a service dog trainer, she's a foodie, a wine snob, and a box, dr- box wine drinker too. You can be both, it's totally doable. She's a cocktail connoisseur, a world traveler, and she's a cult survivor slash blogger, which I may ask about if she'll let me. She is a hobby farm owner. She's originally from Atlanta. She currently lives in the suburbs of Birmingham, Alabama. She's spouse to Brian, dogma to her service dog, a golden retriever named McAllen, a busted ass chihuahua named Fig, her words, not mine. She's a horse mod to a miniature horse named Bourbon. I'm digging the uh, boozy names for these pets. She's a goat ma, if that's a thing, to two Nigerian dwarf goats, which I just learned were named after goat cheese. Wait for it. The one of them is, ma- is named Panny's Gone. And the other one is made, named Bastardo because she was looking for the most outrageous names of goat cheese she could find. She is pig ma, again, we don't know if that's a thing, but we're going to make it a thing, to Julia, a Juliana pig named Ham Sandwich Lunchbox the Third. There is, as far as we know, no Ham Sandwich Lunchbox the Second or First, but there is one Lunchbox the Third. Miss Lunchbox, Mr. Lunchbox? Mr. Mr. Lunchbox. (laughs) All right. She is Ferret Ma to Nargle and Hippogriff, who just joined the team yesterday. Hippogriff did. And then she's Guinea Pig Mom to two hairless guinea pigs named Mandrake and Mertlap. Mertlap? Yeah, we're big Harry Potter dorks. They're all Harry Potter names. (laughs) Still all Harry Potter names. Okay, she is the founder of Rover Chase found of the Rover Chase Foundation which is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to providing professionally trained service dogs to people with disabilities. Her name is Abigail Whithauer. Welcome Abigail. It's so good to have you on the show. It's great to be here. I'm so excited. I've been looking forward to it for a long time. I almost made this whole show about having a ho- hobby farm, so you're going to have to come back so that we can talk about that. Oh, I would love to. I'm obsessed with our little hobby farm. I mean, you obviously keep yourself busy with all those animals. We do. They, they just keep seeming to multiply and we try to <laughs> utilize self-control and it just never happens. Well, you're my kind of lady because if I could, I would be, I'd be like goats, chickens, you name it, <laughs> cows even. I would love to have a cow. All right. But before we go any further, I'm going to introduce our drinking game today, which my guests won't know what the word is. So we're not going to know. We're going to drink as we chat. But you, audience, you're going to drink every time you hear this word and then you might just need to like chill out after because I might choose a very boozy word. Who knows? But make sure that you're over 21 to participate in the U.S. Make sure you do not drink and drive no matter where you are and always drink responsibly. So what are you having tonight, Abigail? I am having McAllen Scotch 12 year. Very nice. She names her dog after McAllen. She drinks McAllen. That's my kind of girl. It's my favorite. (laughs) I love it. And I love somebody who just drinks Scotch straight. I mean, it's the best way. Scotch on the rocks is the best drink ever. Cheers to you. I'm keeping it light today because I might fall asleep with anything heavier. Here is a <laughs> Chenon Blanc from my NakedWines.com membership because I love the fact that I can like get a couple cases a year and it lasts and I don't have to like go wine shopping ever. So here's to you. Cheers. Thank you for being my guest. Cheers. They just made wine shipment legal in Alabama in October, and I haven't signed up for a service yet, so I'm going to have to check that out. Okay, NakedWines.com is great because it's basically like NakedWines.com works with angels. We're the angels to get funds so that they can fund winemakers. And the cool thing about it is it's a membership, so they basically withdraw like 40 bucks from your uh, account every month, and then you start getting kind of like enough money to order a case. And the actual per bottle prices are very, very competitive and their wine is really good. And I actually had an excellent experience with them when I had like kind of like add like my balance was growing and growing and I hadn't ordered a case and somebody called me from nakedwines.com. I think his name was Eric and he basically was like, do you need wine? And I said, actually I do, I just haven't had time. 
And he was like, what do you like? I told him I like everything except for Merlot and Chardonnay. Those are just not my thing. And he sent me this many reds, this many whites. It was summer, so I wanted some rosés in there too. And from my balance, I got like a case and a half for like $200 of like excellent wine. So oh, that's amazing. check them out. Yeah, I'm they are really check good. That out. That's awesome. And for those of you on a budget, ask them if, you know, there's a, instead of 40 bucks, maybe you can contribute less and still be a member uh, of an angel as they call it. All right. So I, I always introduce this show with a game. So I want to play a game with you and we're only going to talk about service dogs, even though I think you and I could probably talk about a million things because we probably have a ton in common, but I want to play service dog facts or fiction. It's a true or false. So I want to, I'm going to give you a statement and you're going to tell me if it's fact or if it's fiction. Are you ready to play? Okay, I'm ready. All right, and if I, if there's any muddy waters here, like it's like fact and fiction, by all means, you're welcome to elaborate. Awesome. All right, here we go. All service dogs are trained to perform the same tasks. Fiction. Fiction. I guess it depends on the person's disability, right? Absolutely, the tasks are geared towards each individual's disability. That makes so much sense. Service dogs can be trained to turn on lights. Fact. That is so cool. How do you train a dog to turn on a light? Um, so we have this adorable little box that's teeny tiny, like the puppies. And when they're super little, it's like the light switches really down low on the floor. And we teach them to turn on when they're tiny, like eight weeks old. And it's the cutest. <gasps> oh my God. I need a video of that, please. Okay. Only retriever type dogs can be used as service dogs. Fiction. But you do raise retriever type dogs, right? We do. Um, we kind of call it the big three. Most service dog organizations use Labradors, Golden Retrievers, Standard Poodles, or mixes of those three breeds. Got it, got it, got it. All right. Oh, uh, service dogs are classified as medical equipment by the ADA. That. That is right, people. You cannot decline a service dog from entering your establishment because it's not an, a pet. It's medical equipment, right? Exactly. So just like you wouldn't say, leave your, you know, your pacemaker at the door, you can't tell them to leave their service dog at the door. That I know. Yes. yes. All right. Um, service dogs can cost upwards of $30,000. That is fact. Um, and that's actually the cost of raising a service dog. They're enormously expensive to raise. It's not profit cost. Oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah. So people would probably be like, oh, those people are wrecking in the money, but they're really not. No, we are not. <laughs> <laughs> she says, no, we are not. <laughs> Service dogs are readily available to anyone that needs one and has 30 K to drop on one. That's fiction. The wait lists are very long. Which is very sad because if somebody has an accident and becomes overnight becomes disabled, they might need something sooner than two years from now. Yeah, yeah, two to five years is the national average in the United States for the wait. That's so crazy. Is that because there's just not enough people breeding and raising them? It has some to do with production. It also has to do with how long it takes to raise each service dog. It's just very labor intensive. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, service dogs have to be allowed anywhere their handler goes. That's usually fact. There are a couple little caveats, but generally fact. Where can they not go? Um, like a sterile field environment. So um, like a surgical operating room. Got it. Um, they can't go somewhere where it would be a danger to the dog or the handler, like a submarine. So if you go on a cruise or and you want to do the submarine tour things that they do on cruises, since you get down and up in a ladder and your dog can't climb a ladder in theory, then they can't go there. Um, some things like really giant Ferris wheels at Disneyland, there's a couple of rides that they can't go on for safety reasons. You're telling me that people actually thought about taking their dog on Space Mountain? Um, McCowan's favorite ride at Disney World is Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh my God, I love that he's, so much. He's obsessed with it. He loves it. Like you can't walk past it without him begging to go into it. Is it the dog with the keys that it, that attracts him so much? Um, it, it's the donkey. Like if you, you know, if he loves the donkey, he loves it. Oh, that's, that is the best fact I've ever heard on this show. Like ever in the history of Covered in Pet Hair. That is the most amusing bit of trivia I've ever heard. That's awesome. There is one certifying entity for service dogs. False. That is definitely fiction. 
is there any one umbrella certifying agency? Not in the United States, there is not. There are, there is in some other countries like UK or maybe? So some other countries are more regulated with governing bodies than we are in the United States, um, as is true in many areas, but in the mm -hmm. United States, there is not a governing body at all. Gosh. We're going to talk about that in the second part of the show, because I think that leads to some pretty big problems. Um, I have two more for you. All service dogs must wear a harness or signage to indicate that they are service dogs. Fiction. They do not have to be readily identified as service dogs, which yes. we can probably also discuss later in the show. Yes, absolutely. And then anyone can train a service dog. That's actually fact um, with practicality caveats, but factually, yes, that is true. Yes, so it doesn't, because there's no certifying entity, it's not like you have to be certified by this entity in order to train this dog. I could train a service dog, but because, but I'm not a dog trainer. So like at me as a, just a regular person could train a service dog. But do you think that I, that a, just a gen, the general public would have the skills to train a service dog? So I think it's possible. There are certainly some really beautifully owner trained service dogs in existence and working in the United States. My friend Jess has one. She's a lovely, lovely dog. There are several examples, but it's quite a challenge. It's taxing both physically, which is sometimes in disagreement with someone's disability. And it's right. also very taxing emotionally. Interesting. Why is that? Well, um, it takes a really unique and special kind of dog to be a service dog. So if you get a puppy as an owner to become your service dog, that dog may not be best suited for that kind of work. And now you're already really attached to your puppy and you have to make a decision that maybe this isn't what this dog wants to do with their life. And that can be really challenging. I love that. I love that you are saying that it's their choice because that I've recently just put out an episode about holistic dog training and it was about making a joint decision to train right and if the yeah, dog is not a willing episode oh good wonderful thank you and if it, the dog's not a willing participant chances are the training's not going to go that well is it exactly it's um you know they're they're servants to their cause and if they don't find joy in the work it's really inhumane to the dog and it's also just not a fair question yeah, that's so cool. That's a really good perspective. Thank you for sharing that. So how did you get started in training and raising and breeding service dogs? So it's quite a crazy journey. Um, I started in a dog show family. So um, dog show families tend to be pretty generational, not always, but usually. So I was showing dogs as a very small child. Um, so I think my interest in genetics and breeding probably started there as showing AKC dog show events. Um, and then um, my parents were quite insistent that I go to college, even though all I wanted to do was do dogs all the time. So um, my compromise was that I would go to college, but I was going to raise service dogs for a very large national organization while I was in college away in the dorms, like a crazy person. So um, I raised two service dogs in college in dorms full time. And it was, it was great. It's not for everybody. Please don't listen to this and be like, I'm going to raise a dog in college. <laughs> um, it was a very different college experience, but it was great for me. It really suited what I wanted to do. Um, and then, um, when I graduated, I, uh, was still working with a larger organization as a puppy raiser and, um, just kind of by chance, I became disabled myself. And so, uh, got a service dog and started working a service dog and just became more and more impassioned and then started the nonprofit. That is amazing. I mean, talk about fate, uh, you know, ready to go, ready to take on whatever life sends your way. That's amazing. I'm sorry to hear that you are struggling with a disability, but I mean, I can't think of anybody better to raise and train and breed service dogs than somebody who l knows how important they are. So did your college allow you to have dogs in the so dorm? I, or I went to a I went to a very small private liberal arts college and um, it took a lot of petitioning um, and, and some discussion about legal decisions. And um, mm. But what ended up doing it is that larger universities had students raising dogs at college. And I um, 
I, I can be pretty tenacious when I get something on my mind. And so I reached out to every dean and chancellor of every school that had a dog currently being raised on campus. And they were amazing. They all wrote letters directly to my dean. And when we had our meeting, I had um, between 15 and 20 handwritten signed letters from deans at huge colleges and universities all over the country. So, and they couldn't really say no. Wow. I, I couldn't tell about the tenacity. I couldn't tell. Just right. It's a, it's a mystery, a mystery. <laughs> didn't tell. Uh, well, how many litters have you done or had since you breed them? Um, since you started, I was looking on your website, you have like the 2019 class, the 2018 class, which I think is adorable. So how many have you had? We, um, our F litter, which is our fourth in-home litter is eight months old now. And we are hopefully going to be expecting our G litter in the next few months. But um, my mama dog is deciding to take her sweet time with being ready to have puppies. So we're just being very patient. Oh my gosh. How long is the gestation period for, for dogs? The gestation period is quite short. It's only about 63 days. So 61 to 63 days, but they only come into season twice a year. And that's when you can breed them. And she was due to come in season um, about 28 days ago. And she's holding strong, just not interested. (laughs) I love that. Is that like a hormonal thing or is it, how does that work? You know, um, it is hormonal. Um, it can also have to do with weather and seasons and things like that. And we've had some crazy weather in Alabama this year. So, um, my theory is that that's what's got us like just a little bit off schedule, but you know, 20 to 30 days here and there, even 60 to 120 days is not a huge, a huge wow. difference in missing. That's so crazy. The survival instinct, man, that is uh, impressive, right? Like the, she's it like, is. I'm not going to have babies in this. I'll wait. Yeah. She's like, no, I'm just going to wait. And we, we is- learned a long time ago that you just can't plan your calendar around anything. You just plan it around whenever they decide to do it. That is so cool. So how much work actually goes into doing all this? It's a lot of work. Um, it's a lot of pre-planning work. So um, when we have a dog that we think is going to be a good candidate for our breeding program, we pull them out at eight weeks old, but we can't do the genetic health testing that we're committed to doing ethically until they're two years old. So we work with them and just train them and give them loving homes and they sleep in people's beds until they're two. And then we do the genetic health testing um, and assuming that they pass, then we breed them at about two, two and a half years old is pretty typical for when we start. Um, but it takes two years of planning to even get a dog ready to be bred. And then um, I think I've had this litter planned for a year and a half. So like done, planned, ready. The, the boyfriend is all picked out and everything. So <laughs> we're just waiting. Are you going to breed a McAllen? So McAllen has, is the, actually the sire of all the puppies we've done up until this point. So he's on a little break and we're breeding his daughter is the next litter. So we're breeding her to um, a really fantastic golden that I can't talk about yet because it hasn't happened yet, but I'm very excited <laughs> about it. And then McAllen will be bred again. His new girlfriend is, um, she's right about 16 months old. So he'll be bred again um, early next year. That is so cool. And just so that those are that are not familiar with the genetic testing, it's because you don't want to continue any genetic uh, mutations that are bad for for dogs, right? Like exactly. degenerative myelopathy, things like that, that are. Yeah. So like hip dysplasia, elbow dysplasia, heart disease, things like that. We just feel like that um, we have an ethical obligation to only breed dogs that are really going to be the best representatives of both their breed and also of pet dogs in general. And that means healthy, long lived dogs with really high longevity rates, which in Goldens is very important. Right. So um, that's super important to us because we think rescue is incredibly important. And if we're going to add dogs to the community, we need to be sure that we're adding dogs really ethically and responsibly to the community. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you're spending $30,000 on a service dog, you don't want them to die at seven years old of something that was, you know, that is genetic and could have been found at two, 
Absolutely. These dogs are lifelines to their handlers. And so we want dogs that are, that have the best opportunity to be long lived working dogs, um, that aren't going to struggle with, um, arthritis or, or preventable things that we, we can predict and prevent. That's always our goal. Yeah. Do you find that, I mean, I think putting a pet down euthanasia is always devastating, but do you find that somebody who has a service dog is even more attached and has a harder time with that? Yeah. You know, it's, um, it's, these dogs are, they are pet dogs for sure. They're, their pets. They spend time, they play ball right. with them, they sleep in the bed, but it's also, um, a huge, life support change. So generally we like to place a second dog long before we're in a position to need to humanely euthanize their previous dog. So we like to get them in place and working with their new partner before they're having to make those difficult decisions. So we really like to retire their service dogs where they're still very much in their golden and happy years um, and working with a newer partner. That is very cool. I like, I'm glad I asked that question because I did not know that. Well, I really need to take a break right now to listen to our sponsors, but I want to come back and talk to you more about the industry at large, the history of service dogs. So don't go anywhere. I will be right back with Abigail. She's going to teach us more about service dogs. Welcome back to Covered in Pet Hair. I'm your host, Isabel alvarez Arada, and today I'm speaking to Abigail Woodhauer, who is the founder of the Rover Chase Foundation, who is a 501c3 that places the best service dogs with people who have with disabilities. And I want to talk to you, Abigail, about the history of service dogs. Uh, in this game, which is called the history of service dogs, we're I'm going to ask you a few things that I uh, want you to answer. Don't worry if you don't have the answer. We'll talk about the answer. But it's not a true or false. I want you to give me an answer. See how much you know about these service dogs. All right. All right, let's do it. All right, when did service dogs become recognized in the US? I believe it was somewhere in the 1950s with guide dogs where they were really widely used. I'm not 100% sure. So technically the term service dog was uh, really starting to be recognized with the ADA passing in 1990. But yes, organizations have been training dogs since before then, but that was the first time it was actually recognized legally in the United States. Okay. So, uh, but you're right. That was the, the, the seeing eye dogs were actually the ones that yeah. were recognized before that. And that was pretty much all that you had as far as service dogs before 1990, right? Yes, absolutely. It was, it was definitely that ADA passing where they got a broader terminology and used for more things. Yes. And recognition and respect as they should have had all along. What former president had a service dog named Sully? Uh, George Bush Sr. That's right. Do you know what Sully's breed was? Uh, A yellow Labrador. That is right. And how long did Sully work for George H.W.? That is a great question. I think maybe four or six years. It was not terribly long. It wasn't. It was less. It was six months, according to Wikipedia. But I thought it was longer, too, because he literally sat by his casket. Yes, that I think is one of the most iconic pictures of a service dog in our history. It was it was a beautiful picture. I know I'm getting chills just thinking about it. It was so beautiful. And I think no matter your political stance, we all respected George H.W. so much that it was so nice to see that he had such love in his last days. Uh, So next question, a fresco in which a man is led by his dog was discovered amidst the ruins of the ancient Roman city Herculaneum. What disability is seen in this fresco? Any ideas? Ooh, I have no idea, but now I'm fascinated. Okay, so this fresco is said to date back to the first century AD, and it was a dog, a service dog, is what we interpret it as, leading a blind man. That is way cool. That's very neat. I love it so much. Okay. European wood carvings and Chinese scroll paintings from the Middle Ages also show dogs leading people who were blind. What else do we know about early dog helpers or service dogs? I don't know. I'm I'm curious to know now. Nothing. We literally know nothing, but we know that in ancient art, we have seen dogs helping humans 
in capacities that we would now call service dogs. Isn't that so cool? That's really, really cool. I know. I'm like, when I was doing this research, I was so fascinated because it's like, we've always known that we don't deserve dogs. We've always known that there's always been like a really wonderful relationship between humans and dogs. But to know that there was a blind man in the first century AD that was, you know, immortalized with his service dog is so, so cool. Well, that is very cool. But there is always a dark side to everything that has a bright side. And from obviously from this conversation we've had so far, the industry is not regulated in the United States. Why is that a problem? So I think, you know, this is certainly a pretty controversial topic. And I like to be really open that there is a lot of controversy. And there are many people that are running big organizations that disagree with my particular opinion. I do think regulation is best for our industry. And I think it's best for many reasons. The big question is how do we regulate an industry without disenfranchising individuals with disabilities? And how do we regulate an an animal or a piece of medical equipment that is living and keep that regulated and safe while not putting undue burden or burden that would not be put on an able-bodied person to the individuals who need these animals. And it's really complicated. Um, but I do think it needs regulation because I feel like that, in my opinion, the way that we're going currently, there are dogs that are out either with people without disabilities pretending to have a disability to have their dog, or more commonly, in my opinion, undertrained dogs mm -hmm. with people with legitimate need. But every time that a business owner has a bad experience or a news story goes that a service dog bites someone or anything like that, we're just chipping away at the legitimacy of the work that these dogs do and the legitimacy of the people that they help and how they can help them in a unique way. So I, I personally am very pro-regulation and it is definitely a controversial topic. Yeah, I imagine as, as with everything, I mean, the pet industry at large is unregulated. Dog training, yes. not regulated. Pet care, in-home pet care, not regulated. You're letting strangers into your home that may or may not know what they're doing, may steal from you, and they can still call themselves professional pet sitters. Uh, the um, the pet food industry is mostly unregulated. I mean, everything's unregulated. But yeah. when you're investing $30,000, approximately, because I'm sure there are more expensive mm -hmm. dogs, that could lead to some sketchy situations where there's fraud. Is that something that happens in the service dog industry? Yeah, it's absolutely something that happens. In the last couple of years, a fraudulent service dog trainer was actually taken to court and, and did get quite a lot of penalty for placing undertrained or, or completely untrained dogs um, mm. for $30,000. And he was brought up on fraud charges. And I'm very glad that that happened. Um, the other thing is that, you know, we get asked all the time, why does not insurance cover these dogs? Why does not insurance cover these dogs? And that's such a valid question. And ultimately, without regulation, I don't think the American healthcare system will ever cover service dogs. But with regulation, I think there's a really legitimate opportunity for them to be covered by insurance, which would greatly benefit the disabled community. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, I, with my, you know, corporate brain on as an insurance company, I'm not going to pay $30,000 for something I don't know is actually trained properly. And it's going to do the job that it says it's going to do. Right. Uh, sure. the FDA makes sure that the pacemaker that I cover as an insurance company works as it says it's going to work. Right. And helps this person with what they need. But if there's no regulation, then I can't support that, especially not at the price tag of $30,000. So if somebody does find themselves in need of a service dog, what do you recommend they do when they start their process searching for one? So I think um, the best thing to do is to contact organizations that are, um, they don't necessarily need to be nonprofit. There are lots of really valuable for-profit service dog organizations that produce amazing dogs, but I think they need to 
to look at organizations that have a history of dog placement and that are honest about how many dogs they have placed. And it does not need to be a large number. There are dog, there are organizations that are boutique, much like ours, we're a relatively small organization that places dogs regularly and talk to them about what kind of dogs do they place? Does that meet your needs? Do they place a dog that is going to meet what you need for your disability? Because there is not there are not very many organizations that can place every kind of service dog for every kind of need. Right. So everybody has little niches. Um, and then I always say it's best to apply to multiple organizations. I think it's a great experience for the individual to see what different application processes look like and what they're most comfortable with. And you need to have a great relationship with your organization. You're going to be working with them very closely for a decade. So make sure that you like the people that you're working with, that you agree with their values, whatever those values are, and that they're placing the type of dog that's going to suit your needs. So why are you working still with the organization? That's actually new to me. Why, why do you stay in touch? So, um, you know, they're, they're living beings. So things change. And also by the nature of most disabilities, disabilities change. And so as disabilities change or progress or lessen, even we need discussions about how that dog needs to adapt and new skills, or, um, you know, our favorite call to get ever is, Hey, my disability has really gone into remission. I don't think I need to work my dog every day. What do I do next? How do I keep them happy and engaged? I love those calls. Like nothing makes us happier than that. You know, in a perfect world, we wouldn't need service dogs. And so um, I love those calls, but also things change with the dogs. Maybe something medical comes up. Maybe they have a behavioral change. Maybe they had a really traumatic experience because we have so much fraud in this industry. It is not uncommon for a fully trained service dog to have a really bad experience with a fraudulent service dog in public. Public, whether that dog attacks them or bites them. And we prep our service dogs for that because it's so common, but sometimes things happen that are really traumatic and we have to do a little bit of, um, reparative training. Wow. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, if they're yeah. forced to be in the same area because they're both service dogs and both equally welcome and one is not properly trained, that could turn into a serious situation. We assume that our dogs are going to be aggressed on at least two to three times a year by a fraudulent service dog presentation. Wow. Wow. And you mean fraudulent service dog, not necessarily like an emotional support dog or anything like that. You're talking about a dog that's in a place where only service animals are allowed and is just not, not It's being passed off as a service dog without a disabled handler. Oh, without a disabled handler. Okay. And a pertinent training, of course. Mm -hmm. So do you, uh, do you only provide service dogs to people nearby because you need to be in touch or can, will you adopt out to anywhere in the U S we place anywhere in the U S. Um, and then we certainly have, I have some colleagues in Canada that we talk closely with. We have not placed a dog in Canada and Canada really has some good options of their own. So I don't anticipate that happening, but we place all over the United States. We have dogs working, um, lots of States at this point. And I think, uh, this next round of placement will have even more diversity in placement. And you basically already have like people waiting for this next litter. My next group of five will be ready for placement in September. So they're, they're finishing up their training and they're already, um, in, in placement. So we already know where they're going. Oh my gosh. So amazing. That is, those are some lucky dogs. Cause I'm sure you do some serious vetting before you let them go anywhere. We do. And we get so excited about match camp and placement. It's our favorite time of year. We're just like giddy about it. And we keep it a secret from the handlers, which dog they're going to get. So they don't know until the first day of match camp. And it's like our favorite day. It's happening in September. And I'm already so excited about it. Wait, what's match camp? What's it like? So match camp is 10 days. So it's like crazy intense and it's 10 days. All the recipients come and stay at a big conference hotel. We do 10 days of education and bonding with their dog and teaching them how to work with their dog and relationships. And we've already done usually about six months of interviews and acceptance to the handlers, but it's the first time that they meet their dogs. And it's, it's just the best. It's my favorite thing I've ever done my whole career. Okay. So when are you doing a documentary where we can follow all of this, especially, especially match camp? 
I know I would totally be open to that because, you know, I'm very shy, so I don't like documentaries. So <laughs> I would definitely do that. But there actually is an excellent documentary on Disney Plus. Okay. called Pick of the Litter. Um, and it's well worth the watch. It's a documentary, particularly with guide dogs. So vision impairment dogs. And it's, if you want to know more about kind of the matching process and generally the service dog process, it's quite a good documentary. Oh, so cool. So I'm in an Airbnb group. Cause I'm an Airbnb host, super host, might I add, uh-huh. but, uh, yeah, thank you. I worked hard for that uh, title. But in the groups, uh, Facebook groups, there's so much hate towards service dogs. I might actually, I'm going to share this interview for sure, but I might share that uh, that link to, to that documentary because I feel like there's a lot of hate towards service dogs because people don't want to host them in their home, but they don't understand that the vast majority are basically way more well-educated than most toddlers that you are allowing in your home. And there's no reason to like fret. They're actually somebody there. There's something you want because that person needs them in order to navigate your home. It's a new space. And we obviously want to encourage people with disabilities to live as normal a life as they can travel and enjoy and thrive. And this is the way that they can. So to any haters out there, I'm up, I'm up flood you with links. Yeah. And I think that brings up a really important point. You know, I I think that um, I empathize with both sides in the Airbnb situation because I absolutely have a friend that runs Airbnb. She's she's like very into it. And I know that she's had experiences where somebody has said that their dog is a service dog and it destroys her Airbnb. And that is a huge issue. And I I don't want to discount that at all. I understand why hosts are are hesitant. Right. Um, but I also, you know, we work with all of our recipients and we're very close with them and it is really stressful that they get kind of this huge inquisition and, and ultimately a violation of their personhood and they're, they're treated as other because of these bad experiences. And that kind of loops us right back around to regulation. And what is the solution here? Because it can't continue as it currently stands because it's fair that Airbnb posts are hesitant about placing service dogs. And it's also fair that disability uh, people with disabilities are frustrated that they're having to do all this gatekeeping to get their dog there. Yes. It's discrimination straight up. Like if, you know, and up till very recently, Airbnb was half at fault because they were not making a distinction between a service dog and an emotional support animal, Mm -hmm. uh, or service animal and an emotional support animal. Recently they separated the two. So now they're not loop like lumping everybody in together. Now there is a distinction. And I do think that is an important distinction because one thing is a service animal. And another thing is an emotional support animal, not to discount the importance of both, but they are different because of the ADA legally. They're they're different. Yeah. They're quite different and they're both very important. They, they provide wellness and well being to their handlers, but they are quite different. Yeah. Especially legally, the ADA has not recognized emotional support animals. As far as I know that they focus on service animals as medical equipment. And like I said, you can't tell somebody to leave their pacemaker at home. So in your Airbnb, they're, they're welcome because they are medical equipment. All right. So tell us all about the Rover Chase Foundation and how we can learn more about it. Sure. So the Rover Chase Foundation is um, all on social media. And if you guys want like some serious puppy content, social media is the place to do it. So you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Um, I'm the first to say I'm not super great at TikTok, but I have an amazing admin that runs our TikTok and it's very cute. Um, and But our social media is quite active, um, especially on Facebook. So anytime that we have new puppies, like litters of puppies, that's where you're going to see like your super cute three-week-old golden retriever, like, ooh adorableness that's also where you're going to get all of like the amazing stories of match camp like look at this dog that you've been watching since he was two days old and now he's matching with his amazing match and that's super fun so you can find it on the rover chase foundation on all social media we also have a really active website and that's where you can learn about an application process if you're interested in applying but as a volunteer if you're able-bodied and particularly in the birmingham area we are always 
desperately in need of puppy raisers. These are people that help us raise these service dogs from the time they're eight weeks old until they graduate as service dogs at 24 months old. And they are vital, vital, vital to the success of service dogs. They teach these dogs how to live in the house, how to sleep in the bed, how to go on hikes, how to do all those important things. So you can learn all about that on the website, the RoverChaseFoundation.org. And then always, we're in need of donations. Our goal as a nonprofit is we would really love to be able to place these dogs at no cost to the individual with disabilities. We're about halfway there. We cover 50% of the cost of every dog within our nonprofit, but $15,000 is a lot of money for anyone to raise. It's yes. an enormous amount of money for somebody that is working and surviving with disability in their life on a regular basis. So it's really important. We would love to be able to do that much more efficiently than we're currently doing it. So donations are definitely tax deductible and they are greatly, greatly appreciated. So um, any donation, and we also have an Amazon wish list if you want to donate stuff, um, particularly when it's about to be puppy season, we have lots of Amazon wish list items. Oh my gosh. I, I love what you're doing. I just want to propose a toast to you and the Rover Chase Foundation, your volunteers, your trainers, your board members, everybody. Thank you for this amazing work that you do. And uh, I'm a big supporter of the disabled community, the disability community. And I love that they have this resource that you are working to help them make service dogs more attainable. So thank you. Here's to you. Cheers. Thank you. I had a great time. Me too. I can't get over how gorgeous you are with that purple hair. Oh, thanks. It's like looking at Ariel. The mermaid, but she went purple instead of purple red. Ariel. And I love it. You are such an Ariel right now. And that was my favorite princess ever. All right. So I also want to propose a toast to our executive producer, Mark Winter. Cheers to you, Mark, always. And to our audience, thank you for spending your time with us. Here's to a life covered in pet hair because there's no better way to live. Cheers. Cheers. To learn more about covered in pet hair, please visit coveredinpethair.com or petliferadio.com and for your next birthday make sure that you start a fundraiser for the rover chase foundation so that we can get them more funds and get service dogs this quality of service dog to more people so cheers thanks again and i'll see you next time